Okay. And, and then well, now um, you can start the broadcast. Okay. Okay, and my screen looks the way it should now, correct? Yep, it looks good. Yes. Good. So I'm going to start the broadcast uh, right now, and then we'll hear a little voice. So is everybody ready? We'll, uh, we'll talk to everyone later. Here it goes. Ready. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everybody, on the call to the Green Hotel webinar series. This is our second webinar, and it's going to be a, a quite an interesting one, so I'm glad you're here. I think uh, you will get a lot of information that will help you uh, reduce costs and improve the reputation of your hotel. Uh, I'm Dan Rubin. For those of you who weren't on the call last time, I'm the Executive Director of Boston Green Tourism. We're an association of around 30 greater Boston hotels that are improving their environmental performance. I also put on green hotel workshops around the country and uh, consult with hotels around the country. Today's, the, the, the object of this series, boiling it down, is to help hotels reduce their energy, water, waste, and toxins. And in doing so, put them in a great position to become green certified by various certifiers. We have six webinars in the series. This is the second one. If you haven't registered for the rest of the series, please do. Um, we have good attendance. We should have over 100 people uh, on, on this call. We had about 125 uh, registered. Also, as part of this grant, now this is an Environmental Protection Agency grant that is uh, allowing, this, uh, allowing us to produce this webinar series. Um, as a part of the grant, I'm doing one-on-one -on -one sessions with 10 hotels. I already have five scheduled. Uh, so if you're interested in having your hotel or hotel group be one of them, please contact me. This is our session for today. I'll be speaking about how hotels reduce energy use. Uh, Howley Fowler will talk about how to green one, one's uh, food service. Craig Nicholson is going to talk about how to get more green into your renovations. And we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A. Uh, two program notes. Type in your questions during the session. If we don't get to them, we'll answer them personally. And we, we won't get to all of the questions. We'll get to, hopefully, we'll get to at least a few of them. These presentations will eventually be posted, uh, hopefully in a month or so. Um, I'll notify everybody who registered when they are posted. Uh, but if you want to get the PowerPoints of these presentations, please either uh, write, uh, uh, send us a note in the questions today uh, or send me a, a personal note and uh, we'll send you the PowerPoints. OK, how do US hotels reduce their energy use? Um, hotels, I've worked with hotels that have cut their energy use by over 40%, and they're still going. Um, it's commonplace for hotels to do projects that cut their energy bills by over 20%. Um, and again, they only, they're only getting at a part of what they could do. So there's a lot of money here to be saved for hotels uh, on reducing energy use, and that's what this session is about. Step one, assess your hotel, benchmark it, identify your opportunities. So start with your own assessment with your own engineers and your own green teams. Uh, review this presentation is probably the most comprehensive uh, uh, presentation you'll find on ideas for reducing energy use. But look over other energy efficiency checklists as well. Um, calculate your hotel's Energy Star score. So if you haven't done it already, uh, Energy Star scores are listed from 1 to 100. And if your hotel is a 40, for example, you know you're more energy efficient than 40% 40, 40 of hotels and less energy efficient than 60%. It gives you a good idea of where you're at. And track it over time. Uh, you could also review the hotel and motel section of the Energy Star Building Upgrade Manual. It was written in 2007, so it's a bit dated, but it's still helpful. Um, consider putting meters in your hotel so you not only understand how much energy your hotel is using as a whole, but where you're using that energy. You could do the same for water. And then, importantly, get an energy audit if you can. I recommend a, a full retro commission or an ASHRAE level 2 audit if it's affordable. 
If those are not affordable, then get a less thorough audit. A retro commission, by the way, is a study of the hotel energy systems to see if everything is working as it should and what needs to be repaired and to also give ideas for improvements. Okay, so you've done your audit and then you look at what are the different areas in your hotel that you, where, where you have opportunities to reduce your energy use. And these are the different areas that I will be covering today. <clears throat> Some building managers have cut their energy use by 10 percent, you know, just by improving the, the maintenance of their building. I threw a few things down on the list, but obviously the list should be much longer than this. Um, in my own home, I have a, a, a boiler, and when the technician was working on it a while back, we were talking about off when they're not. Um, you're just wasting energy when, when you have, um, when you have uh, HVAC on for areas that don't need them, when areas are being lit unnecessarily, and when, when electronics are running uh, and nobody's using them. The best way to shut them down for HVAC and lighting is energy man management systems with occupancy sensors. If, um, so I strongly encourage you to put those occupancy sensors in. Uh, until you do, if you haven't already, then, then train your staff to do it. Uh, you could program your mechanical equipment to operate only when it's needed, and your function rooms, your event rooms. Schedule them tightly, if possible, so you don't have to keep those rooms conditioned all day long. Your drapes and blinds, consider uh, strategically opening or closing them. Uh, if it's in the winter, maybe you want to open them to get the sun in. Um, if it's in the summer, maybe you want to keep them closed to reflect the sun. Um, also, you, want to, you may want to take advantage of the free light so you could lower your lighting use uh, in, in your rooms. Consider delamping if there are areas where you really don't need light. Um, for your towel and linen reuse programs, design them to be opt-out rather than opt-in. And what that means is that um, most of your guests, no matter how many signs you put up, aren't going to do anything. So make them do something if they want to have their sheets and towels laundered. Uh, your guest room hot water, set them at the minimum, temp minimum necessary temperature. Uh, and consider for your staff uh, having them enroll in the Building Operator Certification Program. It trains staff on how to run a building for comfort and for energy reduction. Lighting, as most people on this call know, we are in the midst of an, a lighting revolution, and that revolution is moving towards LED lighting. Uh, I should say a note before I go further. Um, I live in the Northeast and energy prices are high here and the incentives for energy improvements are rich. So there are some, so we may be a little bit ahead of the curve in installing LEDs and in doing other capital intensive projects. But many of these projects, um, you know, let's say they have a one year ROI here, they might have a three, three year ROI elsewhere if your energy prices are low and you don't have rich incentives. Um, but, but, um, so LED lights is definitely the direction that we're moving for most forms of lighting. They reduce energy costs, um, they reduce labor costs because they last so long, and they reduce air conditioning costs because they don't cast off much heat. Um, compared to fluorescence, they have better dimming and better color rendering. Uh, new products are introduced all the time, and the prices are still dropping uh, steeply for many LED products. There, there's still, there's a great variance in the quality of the LEDs that are out there, and there are lemons on the market. So to avoid that, get Energy Star or DLC approved bulbs, make sure you have a long warranty, and, and get them from, custom, uh, from companies that are going to be, that you know are going to be around for a few years, so you could uh, uh, call in those warranties if any of the bulbs flow out early and test them. Some hotels test extensively the different LED lights before they approve them. 
for tube lighting, if you still have T12s, replace them with T8s or T5s. LED uh, tube lights are often the best option now, and, it, and uh, if they're not in your case, they probably will be within a year or so. Use natural light where you can and adjust your lighting to the daylight uh, levels. Hopefully do it automatically with, with, and, and with dimmers. Shut off unneeded lights with sensors or timers. Use photo cells for exterior lights. Uh, give staff and guests personal lighting control where possible so they could turn on lights when, when they most need them. In your stairwells, motion detectors can dim lights to 15% when the stairwells are unoccupied and then turn on in a second when people enter the stairwells. Uh, consider other advanced lighting controls like variable load shedding during periods of price spikes um, or task timing. Plug load. Everything that plugs in, all the equipment that plugs in, you could either buy more efficient or less efficient equipment. So buy more efficient equipment, certainly at the least buy Energy Star equipment, and even within Energy Star, buy the, 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 ener buy the equipment that uses the least energy to meet your needs. HVAC systems. So the next four slides are on HVAC systems. I'm not an engineer. I'm not an HVAC expert, but I've, I've uh, seen a lot of presentations about them. So this is uh, what I find from the presentations. Uh, as mentioned, get a good audit. Have an expert review your system and, and make uh, recommendations to you. As you reduce your need for as, as, you're, as you become more efficient, you could often get away with smaller sized equipment. Schedule your HVAC so it runs only when necessary using both automation and daily management from your chief engineer. Um, use variable, vol variable air volume air handling systems and variable speed drive. So when you're moving around energy, when you're moving around air or water, um, these this equipment allows you to uh, match the speed that you need rather than be on full blast uh, or uh, rather than being fully on or fully off. Common space automation like your event rooms, restaurants, etc. Consider demand control ventilation. In other words, you have an event room, 200 people come in from a, for a meeting, the CO2 sensor picks that up and it adds ventilation to the room. They leave, the CO2 sensor picks that up, and it shuts down the ventilation. I also have temperature and lighting controls that um, uh, return the temperature to baseline and reduce the lighting levels when, um, when people leave the room. Same, of course, for your guest room, very important. Set your air handling unit static pressure as low as feasible. Um, something new on the market are low pressure drop, high efficiency filters for air handling units. So as you're bringing fresh air into the building, um, it takes less energy to push the air through the filters. Uh, they last longer so you don't have to replace them as often. It reduces waste and labor. Um, but you'll probably need pretty good incentives to make them cost effective at this point. During the right seasons, use free cooling with outside air instead of air conditioning. Um, if your hotel is configured correctly, consider energy recover, recovery ventilation. So in other words, uh, instead of uh, when, you're, when you're ventilating air from your building, you could pick up the temperature and use that to help condition the incoming air. Bathroom ventilation. If you're doing a big renovation, consider buying new fans with Energy Star units. Um, uh, the, the reason is that um, they'll use a lot less energy, they're quieter, the motors will last longer, and they'll often have humidity or moisture sensors, so they'll run in the bathroom only when needed. And they'll shut off when, when, uh, when there's no longer uh, sufficient moisture in the bathroom. Um, look at your boilers and your chillers. If they're, very in, uh, if they're very inefficient, consider replacing them with very efficient new boilers and chillers. Uh, in Europe, they use chiller control valves that um, prevent the chiller from activating when it's not necessary. Uh, those are, it's been slow to catch on in the States, but uh, the technology is here and you might consider it. Combined heat and power, also called CH CHP or COGEN, 
uh, could be cost effective uh, if your hotel has high hot water needs. I'll speak about this in a future slide. Use energy efficiency PTAX and VTAX and motors. Um, you might just replace the motor for rooms with high occupancy rates with ECM motors. And I'll talk about that more on the next slide. Consider also replacing your PTAX with heat pumps. Heat pumps um, uh, are, can be more energy efficient and save you a good deal of money and be a, a worthwhile investment. Use ceiling fans to augment air conditioning and heating. Uh, if, if, you're use, if you're heating up an outdoor space, like the outside of your build, building, uh, the, the outside of your entrance during the winter, or if you have a, a parties outside or dining outside and you're using outdoor heating, use gas-fired infrared heating. They have radiant heat and it's more, uh, it's more efficient. For your energy management systems, if you have had energy management systems for a number of years now, uh, consider uh, updating it with better user interfaces, better occupancy sensors, uh, scheduling and setback capabilities. And then insulate your ducts and hot water pipes if you haven't done so already. One slide on motors. In commercial buildings, most motors <coughs> use more energy than necessary, and they don't perform as well as necessary. Uh, they're often not maintained well. They have improper refrigerant charge, expansion valves need adjusting, dirty air filters. Um, if you can't maintain them well uh, with your own staff, consider having a service maintain them. Um, as mentioned in the last webinar, also for your old inefficient motors, consider replacing them with ECM motors, electronically commutated motors. Uh, the best ROIs are in ref uh, refrigeration motors because they run 24-7. Again, consider them for the guest room if, if you have some very high occupancy guest rooms um, and consider them for your pool and spa filter pumps. Each, in the, each circumstance is different, and you'll have to do the math to see where they make sense and have a good enough return on investment. When you're replacing your motors, consider getting ones that have reports and alarms. Your director of engineering would appreciate that. Kitchens, air balancer kitchens. And add, if you haven't done so already, add variable speed fan controls to your kitchen ventilation hoods and add side panels to those hoods. And the reason is, if, if, you, have the, um, if you have the kind of uh, kitchen ventilation fans that run 100%, you're taking a lot of uh, conditioned air and sending it right to the outside of your building. And you might need 100% when, when dinner's going full blast, but you probably don't need it, let's say, in the middle of the afternoon. Um, your dishwasher exhaust hood should run only when the unit is on. Uh, if you have old dishwashers, they may be very inefficient, and newer Energy Star dishwashers use less than half of the hot water of your older units. Uh, add strip curtains and automatic door closers to your walk-ins, uh, and maintain your refrigerator as well to save energy. Uh, I mentioned DC motors on the refrigerators and freezers. Um, make sure you're not you haven't set your refrigerator and freezer, freezer temperatures too low because each degree, um, the, each degree uh, lower costs you an additional 3 to 5% in, in energy costs. Um, when you're replacing your kitchen equipment by Energy Star, for example, new Energy Star broilers use 25% less energy than the older units. And when you're defrosting your meat, make sure your, your kitchen staff don't, don't defrost your meat under running water. Defrost it in the refrigerator in advance. Reducing hot water use. Uh, consider variable frequency drive water pumps that slow down when there's little demand for hot water in your hotel. Uh, obviously, you need to make sure you're, they're compatible with your boiler system before installing them. Um, use computerized boiler controls that adjust the burner pattern to match the needs of your hotel. And consider heat recovery. So you may be pr producing a lot of waste heat from your cooling systems, from refrigeration and your laundry. Uh, if your hotel is configured in a good way, you may be able to capture that heat to heat your water. Um, for, um, for your guest rooms, consider tankless systems. 
For your laundry, um, consider buying ozone laundry. It uses much less energy. They use cold water for most cycles. They use less water and fewer chemicals. You need to maintain them well. Tunnel washers and other kinds of modern equipment also significantly reduce energy and water use. Make sure you're washing with full loads. Use cold water detergents when you're using cold water. And when you're buying new dryers, buy ones with sensors that stop when the laundry is dry. Uh, I saw a hotel recently that, has, uh, that uses water extraction presses in the laundry. They press the water out of the, uh, out of the uh, laundry when they're done uh, washing them and that before putting them into the dryer, and so it reduces drying time. Um, your swimming pools and your hot tubs. Use covers. Obviously, somebody has to put on those covers and take off those covers. Uh, so if, if uh, you don't want to use the labor to do that, consider liquid pool covers. Uh, they have a very good return on investment. And then again, insulate your hot water pipes and your boilers. If you're a hotel that has a a heated swimming pool or has other uh, uh, needs for hot water, consider a combined heat and power or cogen. Um, it, uh, they're expensive projects. They could have a, a decent return on investment. Um, and it's one of the best ways to substantially use the, reduce the building's energy use. All, um, CHP means that you are generating some of your own electricity and using the waste heat for hot water or space heating needs. So if you have a blackout in your area, well, you're generating some of your own electricity, so you'll be in better shape. Consider power purchase agreements. So instead of buying the equipment, have a vendor buy the equipment and maintain it and sell you the energy at a discount. Um, it's a, uh, your uh, owners might re require a two-year return on investment, but the vendor might say, hey, a four-year return on investment is great. So they'll put it in and sell you the energy at a good price. Consider power purchase agreements also for new boilers, new chillers, and uh, solar uh, panels. Uh, there are probably only a couple hotels on the call that use steam. If you do use steam, make sure you inspect and repair your steam traps regularly. And consider whether for your hot condensate, if you could um, uh, take advantage of that waste heat and you use it to preheat your building's hot water. Other energy consuming systems for your uh, elevators. Um, you could, uh, when you buy new, new elevators, you could get very energy efficient elevators that use less than 50% of your current elevators. That's not going to justify uh, buying new elevators because they're very expensive, but perhaps get them a year or two early uh, and, and take advantage of the energy savings. For your computers, you could reduce energy use by over 50% um, by using Energy Star equipment by using laptops instead of desktops, by using power management, in other words, having your computers go to sleep when people aren't on them for a while, web-based software, fewer servers, and make sure that all of your computers are turned off at night. For your vending machines, use vending misers or EC motors. For your building shell, if you're a, an inn, if you're a small inn, the building shell is very important. Less so if you're a major hotel, but still there are, there are some big uh, energy savings to be had here. So um, particularly with solar gain, if you have windows where you, where you uh, get, have a lot of sun coming through during the day, consider window films. They'll reduce your solar gain. Also awnings, overhangs, light shelves, and reflective shades. Um, they'll greatly reduce your, your, uh, your uh, cooling bills, your air conditioning bills. Um, there's one kind of window film, Enerologic, that also has insulation, so it helps in the, wind, it, it helps in the winter, particularly good if you have single, uh, if you have single uh, panel windows. Um, for your windows, uh, if you're replacing them anyway, consider high performance windows. Um, but uh, don't replace your windows just for the energy savings because the return on investment is not very good. There are other good ways of getting at uh, window energy use. Uh, insulate with energy efficient shades that close at the bottom, use drapes, and window film. Uh, 
weather strip well. So if you have air penetration around your windows, eliminate that. Good for comfort also. For the front of your building, use revolving doors. Um, use infrared analysis to look at your insulation and your to see if you have insulation or moisture problems. Infrared analysis used to be expensive. It's not expensive anymore. Um, green roofs will add insulation and beauty. They'll extend the life of, life of your use. They're great for storm water, reducing stormwater runoff, uh, but they're expensive. So I wouldn't do that just for the return on investment. Transformers, this is uh, transformers um, take the energy, the electricity from outside your building and make it usable inside your building. Uh, their average life expectancy is 32 years, but they vary widely. And when they, if you wait until they break down, you're going to have a, a big problem on your hands because you'll, you'll have uh, one to three days without electricity for a part of your building. So consider replacing them early with new energy efficient transformers. They reduce the uh, electricity use and, um, and the, 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 they don't add so much heat to the inside of your building. Peak shaving and demand response programs. This is something that I believe will become more common in the coming years. So for mo in most parts of the country, your electricity bill is based partly on the total kilowatt hours you used, and partly the kilowatt hours you used during the peak use, perhaps the peak 15 minutes during the month. So you could shave those peak use periods. Um, there are a couple hotels in California now that use batteries to do this. They, they charge up the batteries at night, and they discharge them during their peak periods. Uh, right now, uh, STEM offers this service in California only, but they, they, they're likely to expand. And for Solar City, the, uh, has a system like this for their solar customers. Um, but the price of batteries is coming down and is going to continue to come down at least over the next five years or so. So as batteries become cheaper, this peak shaving ability will become um, uh, more lucrative and more common. Also, utility programs offer demand response programs. You agree to cut power when they tell you to, uh, usually on the, the warmest couple days of the year, and in return you get a monthly check. So you could figure out a way to cut your power use in ways that aren't going to impact your customers very much. Renewable energy, uh, solar electricity, PV, photovoltaic, uh, has a very attractive ROI I can have an attractive ROI under the right circumstances and if your state has good incentives. Um, obviously, you need a good amount of unshaded roof space to make a dent in your property's electricity use. Um, PV prices have come down sharply over the last several years, and they're going to continue to decline, but incentives will likely decline as well. Um, consider power purchase agreements for them. So you don't have to uh, put down any money for them and another company will own them and sell you the electricity at a discount from your, your current use. Uh, solar hot water is more expensive than most energy efficiency measures mentioned in this talk. Um, but the advantage is you don't have to use so much roof space to have a big impact on your bills. Many hotels purchase renewable energy. A big hotel in Boston, the Langham Boston, just did it. Uh, and they only paid 2% more for their electricity. Uh, when you do this, consider using reverse auctions um, because it's a good way of, of reducing your uh, energy purchases. You could also, you don't have to purchase 100% renewable energy. You could purchase a smaller percent. Solar panels and buying green energy are also a good marketing tool for telling your customers that you care about the environment. In conclusion, hotels can sharply reduce their energy use by making smart investments and using good management practices. Uh, and here's my contact information. Um, George, please take, please, uh, take over the screen and pass it to our next speaker, Holly Fowler. I will introduce Holly. Holly is the co-founder and managing director of Northbound Ventures, which is a sustainable consulting firm based in Somerville, Massachusetts. Holly has consulted on sustainable agriculture, energy, water, waste, health and employee engagement, 
to clients of all sizes, including Fortune 500 companies. Holly previously served as the Senior Director of Sustainability and Corporate Social Responsibility for Sodexo North America, the world's largest provider of institutional food services. Um, Holly, please take it away. Um, so uh, Dan gave my, my intro. Um, I'll just say that uh, Northbound Ventures is a boutique sustainability firm focused on sustainable communities and food systems. And as he mentioned, I really cut my teeth uh, in this business with 15 years um, at Sodexo, the last five being a Senior Director of Sustainability in CSR. And so I've spent a lot of time engaging with food service personnel and facilities management uh, operators and teams, um, basically to share with you today some thoughts from the commercial. George, I'm having trouble with the audio. I am. Uh, Holly, we, you're cutting off. Oh, OK. Um, I'll, I'll uh, keep going and let me know if uh, I cut out again, OK? So. Um, our friends at the Food Service Technology Center tell us that commercial buyers commercial building sanitary. Holly, I'm not hearing you well. Um, George, would you recommend that I call in via telephone? Um, yes, if you could do it really quickly. I apologize okay. for. Technical difficulties here. Okay, um, it went fine in in testing. So during this brief pause, uh, Rob, I don't know if you have any questions that came in regarding energy that I might be able to answer. Yes, I do, um, and so thanks for asking that. Um, here's a question I think that you might be able to answer, Dan. It has to do with identifying the lemon LED lighting, uh, lighting system. Mm -hmm. I know you gave some recommendations as to how to sort of avoid that, but someone asked if uh, are there any sort of telltale signs uh, about um, LED lemons that, that maybe you've come across? Well, I think... Um there are bulbs that, that burn out quickly. These bulbs should last for several years, even if they're used 24-7. Uh, and so if they burn out quickly, that's a problem. Also, it's important to make sure to test that, that um, the bulbs work with uh, dimmers and that they dim uh, uh, to the satisfaction of the hotel before, uh, before uh, buying them. Okay, good. And one other thing, uh, you, you mentioned an acronym, it was the DLC, which was a, a way to identify if, if lighting was good. Does that, does that stand for Design Light Consortium? It does. Okay. And uh, can you say anything about that organization? Well, they're, they're an organization that tests, that tests light bulbs. And so you could feel confident if, if they're DLC or Energy Star that the, these light bulbs have been, have been um, uh, uh, fully tested and, and blessed. Um, so if you're going to make a big investment, I, I would encourage you to, to stick with Energy Star and DLC. And also test, uh, you know, there, there are differences in, in uh, LEDs in terms of, of color rendering, for example. And you want to make sure that, that you have bulbs that, that you're going to be happy with, because when you buy LEDs, you're going to have them for a long time. Great. Um, good. I've got another question here. Uh, have you, it has to do with liquid pool covers. And mm -hmm. the, the, really, the, the, um, 
it just has to do with uh, like how, how do they work and uh, and and uh, what what type of experience what have you heard about the liquid pool covers? I believe they work by putting an, an oil over the pool at, uh, when it's not being used and the filters filter that, that oil out um, during the, uh, uh, when the pool goes back into operation. Um, and um, I, I've heard that they work really well. I've talked to experts about it. I was skeptical about them at first because I thought, because I was worried that it would add, uh, you know, chemicals that you don't want to be exposed to in the pool. But, but uh, that, that checks out well. And uh, this is used by, uh, by pools throughout the country. So, uh, yeah, I strongly recommend that people uh, look into it, that, that hotel pools, that, that hoteliers look into it. Okay, and um, another question that I have here is it says that uh, I, don't, I don't fully understand the energy purchase agreements where a vendor provides uh, a machine and, and sells me the energy at a rate. Uh, can you provide more specifics or an example? Yeah, so in a power purchase agreement, uh, let's say you're buying combined heat and power or, or solar. Um, Instead of buying the equipment, you could acquire the, the equipment at no money down. There, there are probably many variations of, of, of a contract. But you could, buy, um, you could buy the equipment, you could acquire the equipment at no money down. The company will install it. They will own it, so they have every reason to maintain it very well. And they're selling you the electricity. So you put no money down. Um, uh, and the company that owns it will will sell you the power. And in typical agreements, they might say we're going to sell you power at a five percent discount of your bill for the next X number of years. Um, so it's a it's a good way of of get of making these major purchases without exposing your institution to risk and uh, and saving your capital for other projects. Okay, and I'm wondering if Holly is back online right now. Um, I am. Can you hear awesome. me? Awesome. Well, I, yes. All right. I, thank you for doing that, Holly. You're a champ. Yeah. No, um, I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, technical difficulties do arise, so hopefully everyone can still see my screen. And appreciate Dan and Rob for for filling the downtime. Um, so hopefully folks heard me, um, and and I think that uh, Dan alluded to some of this, but um, commercial kitchens can be huge consumers of, of energy and water. We're going to explore that a bit more along with looking at um, some other best practices, specifically in the kitchen space of the facilities that you're operating. So in terms of you know why any of this should matter uh, to folks on the, the call, um, cost savings can certainly be significant, and those are often a, a, a huge motor, motivator for, for folks to get interested in this. Um, the Food Service Technology uh, Center estimates that the average commercial kitchen outfitted with Energy Star equipment can save about $4,500 a year, and that's even before we take into account um, additional savings that can um, incur from water reduction, waste reduction, and smarter purchasing. So in addition to the monetary benefits of that, there's also the eco-efficiency. So there's uh, reduced energy consumption, water consumption, waste, and things like that that can tell a good story. Um, there's also the opportunity to establish um, your institution as a leader in the space, um, which is kind of being proactive and progressive. There's also um, an interest in some cases to simply meet regulation. Um, and, and that's happening, too, if we think about things like the state of Massachusetts organic uh, waste to landfill ban for any institution that's producing more than one ton of organic waste a, a week. So in some cases, you know, the business cases that you actually have to put some processes in place to meet uh, emerging regulation. Um, sustainability can also be a very uh, important employee engagement tool and impact recruitment and retention. I know especially when we when we get to um, best practices around reducing food waste, that is a particular area that really resonates a lot with food service staff. You know, they do not like the feeling of 
you know, throwing things away either. And so having a more sustainable food service operation can really help you around employee engagement as well. And, you know, it can be a reflection of overall brand value uh, of your facility, and that can help in terms of business development, depending on how you, um, you know, communicate that out and use it as a marketing tool. And then broader stakeholder health and satisfaction, you know, making sure that your um, clients and customers are, are happy and making sure that, especially on the food side, when we get that, that what you're presenting is, is clear and transparent. They're able to make choices that are in their best interest. So we're going to cover uh, best practices in these kind of four key categories of energy, water, waste, and food. And one of the things that I want to point out here is that um, these best practices can come in at least two forms of equipment and behaviors. And what we know now is that things um, related to behavior change can be as effective in reducing energy and water and waste as uh, implementing high efficiency equipment. So when you combine these two things, then you really have overwhelming um, opportunity for success. But I want to focus uh, as well today on best practices that can have high impact and uh, a quick return on investment, knowing that you know some of you may be in a place to make a investment or undertake a program that's going to be kind of in more intense in terms of um, your, your energy, time, and investment, um, but will have a big impact. So I want you to know about some of those, but I also want folks who are maybe just getting started and looking for where they can have an entree into more sustainable practices um, and get some return on that quickly to help build the case for additional efforts that you have some best practices to take away from today as well. So I'll try not to um, repeat too much of what uh, Dan has presented, but certainly reinforce a lot of the great points that he made um, for facilities and kitchens in particular. So kitchen equipment is obviously very important. Um, the photo here is of the Blink variable speed drive. So having hoods that are automated to run only when they need to be running. Um, having a documented um, on protocol as well for your equipment matters. So many of you may be working in operations where the tradition has long been that when folks arrive in the morning, they fire up all the burners, turn everything on, and get everything ready for the day. And sometimes that's not actually necessary. So having a documented on-off protocol for when equipment should be on and when it doesn't need to be on um, can really significantly reduce energy. Um, also, for um, you know, related to equipment, you know, you want it to be pushed back against the, the wall. You don't want to have it um, working its way out. You want to keep things under those hoods um, in the right position. You want to have your hottest uh, equipment in the middle, such as your fryers and your, and your uh, grills. You want those in the middle so you're trapping the, the hottest heat in the middle. Um, you want to keep the filters clean. I think Dan mentioned that. And it's really easy to add side panels as well. You want to keep everything flowing in the right direction, kind of contained and maximize uh, that equipment. Um, in terms of lighting, Dan mentioned a lot of the, um, you know, trending alternatives. And I'll just add that, you know, what he, what he mentioned is absolutely right. And sometimes what we hear in food service is that, you know, uh, more efficient lighting is not the most attractive lighting for displaying food and making it, you know, sellable out there to customers. And the fact is, uh, a lot of the newer lighting, the CFLs and the LEDs, do come in more sort of decorative forms that you can also use in food service operations. So, so don't let um, you know, the, the, the threat of something perhaps not, you know, you might not think that it's as attractive as what you know, you're used to. But there are options out there that you can, can use. And certainly a lot of the CFLs and LEDs are constantly evolving. And you can think about the having the sensors, the size that you need, the number, the lamping is necessary. As well, all of those things matter. In terms of refrigeration, um, gaskets, making sure that those are you know, in great shape, having door closers um, on your walk-ins, we know that airstrip curtains are not the, the most favorite um, tool of 
uh, food service staff, but every time you're opening a door, you're losing a considerable cooling load. And so airstrip curtains are really kind of low-cost investment that can have a huge impact on your energy use. Dishwashing, um, run full loads, um, use the, the more efficient equipment, the energy start rated dishwashers if you can. Um, there are certainly uh, chemicals out there as well that can help to optimize or reduce um, the, the heat of the water that's required, so making sure also that the temperature controls are set uh, properly is important. Um, if you have uh, the option uh, through your utility of buying energy that is from a renewable source or tying into perhaps renewables that you've invested in to have on site, um, if you can tie the kitchen to those as well, that's great. Um, and uh, closer to the end of the presentation, we'll talk a little bit more, but there are lots of rebates um, available to help you invest in higher efficiency uh, kitchen equipment for your commercial uh, kitchen. So um, make sure that you're taking advantage of those because those can significantly impact uh, the, the time for your return on an investment. All right, so in water, the picture on the right, not the best practice. So um, there, there is a faucet there. So in terms of faucet, especially on your hand sinks, you want to be changing out those aerators. Um, you can get aerators that are less than uh, a gallon per minute use. And you also want to make sure that you're fixing leaks. I know those leaks might seem um, you know, small, but they add up and they can be very persistent. So make sure that on the sinks that are appropriate that you're changing out to low flow aerators and also fixing any links leaks, um, thaw in the refrigerator, as uh, Dan mentioned, um, not uh, under running water. So it does require a little bit of you know, planning in advance, but make sure you're doing that. Um, there is refrigeration out there that is once through water cooled. And um, when the, the doors are open and the compressor is running, water is being wasted. So if you have the opportunity to, to upgrade to air cooled, um, refrigeration as an option. Um, I once walked through a site in uh, Toronto and I could see um, they had a very ancient refrigeration system running there and I could see the water emptying directly into the drain and it's pretty significant and uh, I went over and it's really easy to measure. You can just grab, you can have a, a water flow um, tool or you can even take a measuring cup, which was the easiest thing, and I timed it. And uh, you know, there are two liters of water uh, a minute going down the drain. And I, I asked you know, how, how long it had been like that, and they said it basically was for the last 19 years. So if you factor how much water that is that's being wasted, um, there are more efficient systems. Um, but if you have this system, a big thing to do is just close the door or make sure it's not running when it doesn't have to be. And so that goes to things like ice machines. Um, close the door of the ice machine. I have a lot of photos of walking through accounts where the door is open, open, open. Um, in some cases, too, uh, you might have duplicate ice machines. I've seen you know accounts be able to take one uh, off offline once they realize how much they're actually using versus how much is being produced. Um, so think about that. Also think about um, what you need ice for. So in some cases now, there are salad bars, for instance, that can be uh, cooled through electricity. I've seen you know, the highest efficiency, brand new salad bars, um, and folks just haven't plugged them in. And they're still using ice um, as well. So there's other ways to eliminate uh, water wastage um, in your account. Um, in terms of uh, dishwashing, uh, pre-rinse uh, sprayers, uh, high-efficiency water sense sprayers are available, and they can save you 7,000 gallons a year for up to about $240 just by replacing one uh, of your pre-rinse sprayers with a water sense sprayer. So think about that. Also, again, um, you know, run, run full loads. And cleaning, there are uh, low water techniques. There are microfiber um, mops. Now there's um, also you know, cleaning chemicals that are going to help you reduce the amount of water that you're using. So you're going to want to seek those out and 
how to get at those will also be available in the resources that I will mention at the end. All right, so in the uh, non-organic waste department, um, the best thing that you can possibly do is, is always to prevent waste from, from beginning. So uh, wherever possible, to use reusables and limit uh, your single use and disposable. And where you are going to have single use or disposable items, make sure you're optimizing your ordering with the infrastructure. And that can be done by working with um, doing a little research and finding out what kind of infrastructure is available around you for either recycling certain materials or composting certain materials. Um, so that you're not ordering things that necessarily can't be actually um, treated the way that they're designed to be. So there's no sense wasting a lot of money, for example, on compostables if there's no infrastructure to support composting. Um, so make sure that you're optimizing your ordering with what the infrastructure is available to you. Where possible, you can uh, replace uh, with bulk dispensers. This goes for food items such as um, you know, your condiments, as well as for plastic silverware and things like that, um, where you might need to still use those. Flow in placement is really important. So things as simple as putting you know, silverware and napkins and condiments and all of those things at the end after folks have selected what it is that they're going to have for their meal. So that they're only taking the items that are, are needed. Um, when things are placed up front, folks haven't yet made the decision. They might need everything, so they take everything. And then um, you know, that's a necessary waste. So think about flow and placement. Think about whether or not if you have both options of a reusable and a takeout, if that's potentially you know, needed, that you are you know, placing the reusable or the preferred product um, more accessibly than the disposable. And you can also uh, engage your staff to do this as well. So if folks are coming through the line, uh, you can train your staff who are serving them to initiate the conversation by asking whether or not they plan to dine in or dine out. Um, and if someone says they're dining in, then they should default to a reusable. And then in terms of customer education, if you have any kind of um, post-consumer sorting station, um, be specific. Uh, let folks know what goes where as, as um, items are being returned uh, so that um, not everything just gets thrown into one bin. I'm sure all of you have seen a variety of recycling stations. Um, customer education is, is huge for having those work the way that they're intended to. So help also your customer as they're making those choices to understand. So if you know your facility is able to reduce waste or water or energy by preferring a particular product, let the customer know and help them uh, participate or want to participate in that with you. And going back again to um, how you're going to prioritize what it is that you're using, sometimes uh, space can be a limitation, right, for dishwashing, for using reusables, but there's creative ways. Um, you know, the high, efficiency, the high efficiency dishwashers are making it easier. They're very quick. Can move a lot of um, dishes through those very quickly, but also talk with the waste hauler. Find out what infrastructure is available. Find out what number of plastics can be recycled. Find out um, what criteria is necessary for having compostables be composted, and make sure that you're then harmonizing uh, what it is that you're ordering to have the best end of life possible. The organic. Uh, Waste hierarchy is slightly different. It's a little more complicated than the non-organic waste hierarchy. Um, but again, here the first uh, rule is to reduce or prevent waste from happening. And one of the best ways I know to do this is by knowing what it is that you're wasting to begin with. And um, this diagram comes from LeanPath, which I think is an excellent technology that helps um, locations measure their food waste they're pre-consumer food, food waste. And many of you have already production systems and great retail practices that mean that as you start to sell out of things, you're able to merchandise them differently to still you know, maximize the aesthetic and presentation. Um, but as much as you can prevent uh, food waste from happening, 
or overproducing just to make it look good. Um, that's recommended. And then you can identify partnerships and opportunities in your communities to say work with a, a shelter or a food bank for donating access to food, um, partnership with farmers for feeding animals. Um, different organic ways that you have could be treated differently. So um, your new cooking oil can find a home as well and perhaps be converted into energy. A lot of folks are interested in composting. Folks run to compost as, a, as an option. I just want to highlight here that it's, you know, it's a little further down the hierarchy than most people realize. Uh, but where you can commercial composting tends to be more efficient than on-site composting. Again, though, reducing it or not having it have to be composted is always the best practice to begin with. And then you have kind of the usual suspects very near the end, which is more um, about kind of reducing the actual volume that you have. You have your digesters, pulpers, disposers, and things still end up in the landfill, but they might you know, have a slightly lesser volume when they get there. All right, on food, um, there are a lot of different certifications by category of food. So the same kind of third-party certification doesn't apply to every category. So it might be fair trade for bananas. It might be USDA organic for other produce. Um, but it might be Marine Stewardship Council for seafood, uh, for example. And so there are a lot of different certifications by food category, and this can get um, a little more complicated. I won't go into, into detail, but I, I list the certifications later to kind of the top ones to think and to look for. And Holly, two more minutes. OK, great. Um, what's really important is to define what the priorities are going to be. So to look at your portfolio of um, food and define you know, what's going to be priority. Is it going to be sourced local? Is it going to be sourced and sustainable as defined by third party certification like the USDA organic certification? Um, and to define those terms. So if it's going to be local or sustainable, what certification or what kind of area do you mean to cover? Is it important for you to source from small and medium suppliers? That sometimes can, you know, factor into, you know, your priorities and who you're going to source from. Does it matter if your institution sources directly from a farmer? These are other things to consider. Um, tracking and reporting. There's some pretty simple ways to do this. But sometimes transparency in the supply chain uh, can be a little challenging, but your distributors can can be um, really helpful in helping you know. Uh, what criteria a particular product is, is meeting. Um, and make sure that when you're preparing things, especially for the nutritional value of food, that you're not compromising what's intended. So um, preparation matters. And as much as possible to be offering labeling for nutrition and ingredients on um, content of that which you're preparing and serving. So that's really important to your customers. Um, and I just wanted to highlight kind of exclusive and interesting innovative partnerships like the Boston Seaport Hotel, apiaries and here in Boston, they partnered with Long Trail Brewing Company in Vermont, um, used the honey that they were producing on the roof of their hotel to create um, a differentiated and exclusive uh, beer, the Seaport Honey Ginger IPA. And so food can really offer you some pretty unique um, partnerships and opportunities to differentiate your institution. Um, I've highlighted here just a number of the third-party certifications or standards that you might be looking for, um, either for your building space or equipment or serviceware in your kitchens or for food. And as Dan said, these slides will be circulated so you can spend some extra time looking specifically at these. And then other things to think about as you're measuring your progress and impact, you know, what can you measure? And you know, try to focus on things perhaps that you can already measure. And who's going to be responsible for that and what frequency? Make sure the unit that you're using to measure is relevant. So percentages all by themselves are, are, are not that useful, right? So tie it back to overall spend or overall volume as well and use two, two metrics to help kind of share your progress. Um, go out there and establish your baseline and then set your goal. Make sure you're communicating consistently both internally and externally. And beware of perverse incentives. So having, you know, having uh, donating a lot of excess food is might seem like a win, but it's 
might not be, right? Because you're actually still um, overproducing. So beware the perverse incentives that are in the system. And these resources are wonderful. You'll find everything you need to know about equipment specs, fact sheets, calculators to help you track your progress, case studies, um, do-it-yourself checklists, and um, rebates for looking at how to, how to access um, and invest in more efficient equipment and opportunities. And there's my contact information. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. That was great. Really packed, uh, you really packed a lot of information in that's very valuable. Um, our next talk is going to be by Craig Nicholson on Green Hotel Renovations. Craig is the Director of Sustainable Development for Ajax Consulting Services, a firm that serves as the owner's representative for several large real estate investment trusts and private ownership groups throughout the U.S. Uh, Craig's firm oversees large capital improvement projects such as guest room, lobby, conference facility, and restaurant renovations. Craig, please take it away. Great. Well, thank you, Dan, and uh, thank you to the EPA for sponsoring these webinars. Um, the decision to improve the sustainability of your hotel through renovation is, is obviously it's a critical and important step towards not only reducing your building's carbon footprint and promoting global environmental health, but it's also beneficial to the hotel's bottom line and to your owner's bottom line. I want to thank everybody here that's uh, that's listening in and watching on online. Um, as Dan said, our firm serves as owner's representatives and construction managers on large renovation projects throughout the U.S. Um, as the director of sustainable development for our firm, I'm tasked with ensuring that we're approaching each of our projects with a focus and commitment to sustainability. So I have an, an educational background rooted in biology. So when the average person looks at a building and sees steel and concrete and wood and glass, I tend to think of buildings as living systems. They have their own anatomy that's not unlike our very own. They have a respiratory, a pulmonary, an excretory nervous system. They have skin and skeletal structures. Over the life of a building, materials come in and out. Some materials like water, electricity, and air come in and out constantly, while others like carpet, furniture, fixtures are taken in once, held on to for a while, and then are eventually flushed out as new materials are needed or desired. Framing your thinking in this way will hopefully help you to think more critically about the decisions that are being made when it comes to a renovation. You want to ask questions like, what are the materials that are needed? Where are they coming from? What are their ingredients? And what will happen to them when they're no longer needed? These are important questions and conversations to have when you're planning for the renovation. Another thing you want to look at when, when planning for your renovation is the peak energy loads within your hotel. You want to understand how they're distributed. Um, understanding where that energy consumption is uh, and where it's being allocated will help to plan accordingly and maximize the opportunities for savings. Owners appreciate this because the opportunities that are typically found go directly to the bottom line in the form of, of energy and, and cost savings. The graph on the right depicts a hypothetical load, uh, daily load of a hotel across a 24-hour period. Hotels in the U.S. reportedly use, on average, uh, 12 kilowatt hours of electricity and approximately 41 cubic feet of natural gas per square, square foot annually. Most of the electricity consumption is used for space cooling and lighting, and most of the natural gas is used for space and water heating. So if we think about our hotels as living systems and we investigate how and why we're using the energy that we're using, how can we design them to operate at peak efficiency? And more importantly, given that most of our work uh, is, is on existing buildings, what measures can we incorporate into our renovations to achieve the peak performance that we're aiming for? Even before you start that process of thinking about the upcoming renovation, as, as, as Dan and Holly both mentioned, there's several steps that can be taken that will get your energy efficiency heading in the right direction. These are the low-hanging fruit that you know, have immediate paybacks and typically can be justified as standalone projects. Hopefully you've already implemented some of these, but some examples are you know, utilizing the occupancy sensors for lighting in the back of house areas, along with HVAC setbacks that are minimum levels during low hours of use, um, ensuring that your housekeeping staff is on board with your energy goals, making sure that they're shutting off TVs, lights, turning down thermostats after cleaning each room, if you don't already have occupancy sensors in place. Um, as Holly mentioned, you know, kitchens can be hugely wasteful, so um, there's, there's obviously you know, opportunities there. And then we want to look at things like 
automatic shutoffs, low flow devices, waterless urinals in the public restrooms. Um, as, you know, as Dan has mentioned, water conservation, uh, you know, is, is critical to the, the overall energy savings of a hotel. And we look at it beyond just the water usage. We look and see that, you know, if there's a direct impact on the electricity consumption because oftentimes, you know, the pumps that are pumping the water throughout your building are oversized to meet the maximum demand. We're always trying to push to get some of those higher pieces of fruit um, included into our budgets and plans early on in our in our planning process. Um, here I'm thinking about upgrades and improvements that have a, a longer payback period and perhaps aren't quite as actionable without some impact to operations. And this might include improvements to the building's mechanical systems, upgrades to lighting control, or even improvements to the building facade that on paper have you know, much higher initial costs and therefore longer payback periods. One thing you want to be sure that you do, and it's important to do this early on in the process, to, is to make sure that you reach out to your local utility company to see if they have any incentives available that will help to defray the added cost. A lot of utilities have rebate programs. Uh, some have you know, prescriptive incentives that um, you want to make sure that you, you, know, you, you reach out to them early on to, to take advantage of. You don't want to leave any money on the table. Um, on the back end, realize that, you, know, if you, you don't realize up front that it's an incentive-based program that you need to apply for before you do the, the renovation. Uh, a lot of the rebate programs, you know, you can go retroactively after the work is done and get that cash back, but it's those incentive, those other key incentive programs that you know, require some interaction with the utility on, on the front end so that they know they're helping to influence the decision-making process as well. So in order to fully integrate sustainability into your architectural and interior designs, it's critical that all of the key players laid out here on the screen are represented at the table as early in the design process as possible. Environmental engineering must be integrated into the design process from the start. Following a holistic approach through this integrated design process will ensure that your green objectives are given proper consideration and can be incorporated in the overall design. Having an owner or an operator who understand up front the benefit of pursuing sustainable design measures will also go a long way towards ensuring their successful integration and implementation into the renovation project. To be successful at this, you need to make sure that you're working collaboratively to establish those priorities and goals up front so that the designers and architects can frame their design around those priorities as opposed to trying to shoe the, shoehorn them in after the conceptual or schematic design is established. There's a large number of tools and programs out there that can assist you in, with improving the overall sustainability of your project. Um, hopefully everybody's already familiar with, with Energy Star, which certifies energy efficient products and buildings. I would guess that by now most people have also heard of LEED, which stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. Uh, and there's a set of rating systems for the design, construction, operation, and maintenance of green buildings and neighborhoods. In the context of hotel renovations, we typically go to the LEED Interior Design and Construction Rating System, um, as that's the most appropriate and helps to inform decisions related to a building's location, access to transportation, water efficiency, indoor air quality, and material selection. The one in the middle, uh, Cradle to Cradle, is probably lesser known, but in my opinion, it's is equally important when it comes to selecting materials that will be used in the construction or fit out of the building. The cradle-to-cradle -cradle approach guides continual improvement towards products that are made with materials that are safe for humans and the environment, designed so all ingredients can be reused safely by nature or industry, uh, are assembled and manufactured with renewable, non-polluting energy, are made in ways that protect and enrich water supplies, and are made in ways that advance social and environmental justice. For me, the cradle-to-cradle -cradle approach uh, is much more aspirational than it is practical at this time. Uh, but it gives us something to work towards, and it engages our vendors in conversations that they you know, likely are not otherwise having. So as we think about renovating our guest rooms or our conference facilities or public spaces, utilizing the frameworks that I showed on the last slide, we want to start to understand which components we'll be able to incorporate or impact as part of the process. We also want to establish guidelines for their use that these priorities go from discussion to plan. We want to make sure that when the construction documents are finally issued, that they explicitly require high efficiency lighting and HVAC equipment. We want to be certain that the plumbing fixtures that are, that are specified are as efficient as possible, and that the contractors are being constructed within the plans to use non-toxic non and low VOC materials. Finally, we want to be sure that the specifications for new furniture, fixtures, and equipment are written with that same focus on utilizing non-toxic and rapidly renewable materials. So, the big question 
here is, you know, can you have it all and still get those high guest satisfaction scores that every hotel thrives on? Uh, hopefully this, this case study I'll walk you through will demonstrate that you can. And I, I'm only highlighting one, one hotel here given the time that we have. But we, we try to implement a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the, the things that you'll see here uh, throughout most of the projects that we do. So Hotel Zeta is a uh, boutique project that we worked on in San Francisco. Um, we've been working on it for over the past two years. The design process was initiated in early 2012, and the construction took place between November 2012 and April 2013. The hotel has now been in operation for about a year, and it's getting great press and reviews for its design and guest impact. When initiating the design process, the ownership group knew that they wanted to target what they were referring to as the quote-unquote Twitter millennial crowd. As the baby boomers are aging uh, and retiring, our client wanted to create a product that was really focused on hooking that next generation of business travelers. And they, in leveraging the hotel's um, close proximity to companies like Twitter and Google and Facebook, they knew they wanted to deliver a hotel that appealed to that demographic. So as this was a renovation of an existing hotel, in a repositioning of that hotel, the interior designer tied that tech demographic that they were targeting for their you know, future guests with the concept of renovation and started kicking around words to inform that design direction. Uh, they, the first word which they really, you know, everybody sort of um, really sort of came to and, and liked was this you know, term reboot, which obviously has that, that connection to, you know, to that tech demographic and to the people working in the computer industry. So from there, they continued playing with those rewords, and the process really evolved organically to a point where you know, became a focus on reuse and recycling, and those became the key anchors to the overall design. So once the interior design team and the ownership group agreed on the concept of reuse and recycling as the centerpiece of their relaunch, the integrated design process took on a life of its own. Sustainable design became the focal point of the hotel design. It really is integrated into the hotel DNA now. From the lobby to the quarters and guest rooms, you see all these touches of, of you know, surrounding this, this concept of reuse and recycling. When I say that it was a focal point, I mean that in a literal sense, literal sense as well. If you look closely at the, the photo um, up on your screen, you'll see that those are actually glass, there's 600 pairs of glasses per fixture um, that have been recycled or upcycled uh, from their, their former use. Another chandelier that was used in the lobby uh, is made of broken pieces of Murano glass chandeliers that were you know, pulled away from the trash bin. So the, the designer really you know, took this and ran with it uh, and, and made it the focus as you walk in. Uh, the first statement piece down at the ground level as you come into the lobby uh, is this sort of stately Great Dane that's crafted entirely of tools, utensils, springs, sprockets, nuts, bolts, and you know, old computer parts. All the items have been repurposed from their original use or intention of this beautiful and striking sculpture. The front desk itself is uh, constructed from recycled hardwood timber scraps, stacked one on top of the other. It creates a, a piece that's both functional as a registration desk for everybody that comes in and out of the hotel, um, but it's also visually appealing. The story of the hotel and its design reveals itself in these you know, subtle but surprising ways. It's not in-your-face environmentalism, but it's much more approachable sustainability, the kind that someone can you know, really draw their own inspiration from without feeling intimidated. So, as I said, the owner was, you know, really keyed in on this, uh, you know, on, on, on this focus on sustainability with the hotel. So they, they wanted to be at the forefront with their design. They recognize the financial benefits. They get that. They've been doing it for years. They've been integrating energy, energy efficiency measures throughout their entire hotel portfolio and have a consultancy that goes around the country, you know, doing all those um, audits of their hotels for them and making the recommendations that we then implement as part of the renovation projects. Um, in this case, though, they really wanted to take it even deeper. They wanted to appeal to that guest who, who's, you know, the guest value structure itself um, includes a focus on their own carbon footprint. So with that in mind, installing things like high-efficiency bath fixtures, low-flow faucets, uh, shower heads, and dual flush toilets was, was really a no-brainer in this project. Uh, when we came in, the hotel had three-and-a-half-gallon flush toilets. Uh, they had inefficient shower heads. They had inefficient faucets. We came in, renovated, and, you know, now they have dual flush toilets. Uh, they have, you know, shower heads with a max of 1.5 gallons per minute, um, new faucets, and, and really, you know, carry that uh, throughout. We 
also upgraded the heating and cooling system. We retro commissioned any of the existing uh, equipment that was retained to op optimize its operating efficiency. Um, the mechanical scope also included the installation of a new chiller on the rooftop. We added new variable speed drives for the motors and pumps throughout the building. Um, each HVAC unit uh, within the guest room was serviced to, to be cleaned, uh, inspected, and if necessary, it was repaired or replaced if it wasn't operating at its maximum efficiency. Um, a few years ago, where we were highlighting projects where we were converting incandescent to compact fluorescents, today we don't do a project without LEDs. Um, are they more expensive than CFLs? They are. Uh, but the incremental cost of including them in a major innovation is so small that we wouldn't consider doing it any other way at this point. Um, I think occupancy sensors for thermal control device systems such as INCOM are commonplace today, and we incorporated those changes in this renovation uh, along with occupancy sensors in the meeting rooms, and public restrooms, and back up, back of house areas. Uh, the hotel director of engineering is actually is raving, um, was raving to us yesterday about their ability to, to be able to control uh, the units when guests check out or when guests you know leave the rooms uh, by either you know going back to those setbacks uh, that they've established or given that this is a mild climate you know they can actually just completely turn off the unit while while no one's in there um, and really maximize the, the savings not something we could probably get away with in you know in the middle of winter in Minneapolis or Chicago or Boston but um, but in San Francisco it, it seems to work for them okay So that's a, a close-up picture of the uh, the Great Dane I was, I was mentioning before. If you kind of look closely, you can see that it's all, you know, these found um, metal components, uh, all sorts of, you know, different pieces that have been combined to create this this great piece that really welcomes people when they, they come into the hotel. And Craig, a couple minutes. Okay. So as I was saying, you know, the, the integration in here, um, the, you know, through the designer selection of reclaimed woods for the lobby flooring and walls, they... Um, they used antique doors, wall panels in the second floor playroom, um, which also features a you know vintage uh, refurbished Rochester pool table. This, the area rugs in the guest rooms uh, consist of remnant pieces of rugs that would have otherwise been destined for a landfill somewhere, uh, and were instead stitched together to make a patchwork rug that's that's found in all the king rooms throughout the hotel. Uh, we used a, a nanotech paint on the guest room walls instead of wall covering. Um, the paint which is a product that's uh, manufactured in Florida, um, was specifically selected for its non-toxic zero VOC structure along with the fact that it's highly durable. Um, this, is, this is paint that's actually used in food service, the food service industry, um, because it can literally be hosed down on a daily basis and, and withstand that abuse. Um, it also happens to be mold, mildew resistant, uh, which is a, you know, another great thing when you're renovating a bathroom or if you're in a humid climate. It's much more a difficult installation than typical paint, but once it's cured, it's, it's well worth the effort. Um, the exterior paint, which we've used on other projects uh, from the same manufacturer, um, also has energy savings, um, an energy savings benefit as it has deep heat deflection properties that result in more efficient cooling of the buildings. Wherever possible, uh, we also tried to source you know, domestic vendors for the furniture and fixtures throughout the hotel. Um, talked about the use of the nanotech paint, um, but we also, you know, where we did have uh, wall covering installations, uh, and, and where we had flooring installations, we used low VOC, VOC adhesives. Um, and additionally, our focus on indoor environmental quality included the, the upgrade of the building management system, uh, installation of occupancy sensors for heating and cooling equipment in the guest rooms, and an emphasis on proper and efficient lighting, which combined the focus on utilizing the natural light available to the building, while also installing dimmable LEDs to minimize the electric demands at night when artificial lighting is necessary. So as I mentioned before, the design of the hotel is that it developed and focused on the concept of reuse and upcycling. Um, this, function, this photo here you know, captures that. You have the chandeliers and the dog on the right, but we also have that, that wine bottle at the back bar. Uh, their lobby bar is actually called the SNR Lounge, which uh, stands for Salvage and, and Rescue. Um, you know, and those, those wine bottles you know, make that connection, that local connection to Napa and Sonoma, but those are, happen to actually be recycled wine bottles um, that were you know, collected from wineries in, in Napa. Now that the hotel's um, been in operation for a year, we, we're reaching out to them to try and, you know, evaluate their overall performance, which, which is kind of tricky with this hotel because, you know, if you look at uh, just the baseline compared to the, you know, the prior to the renovation, we really can't look at it that way because the, the occupancy of the hotel is so much higher now than it was before the renovation because it's been so successful. Um, so we're, we're really kind of diving into those numbers and looking more, you know, portfolio-wide basis and trying to understand, you know, and, and really just make sure that, these energy savings are, in fact, paying out for, for the ownership group. 
this is just uh, up on the screen now. It's just some of the, the press that the hotel's been getting. Uh, the feedback's been very positive. A lot of the press really tends to highlight that work hard, play hard aspect of the overall design, um, which you know is really also key to, to a lot of the success it's uh, experienced. Uh, but the, the, the overall sustainability component, uh, it, it hasn't been lost on anybody that's, that's come in and reviewed the hotel. Um, the hospitality design quote down there is actually the title to their feature article that they did on the hotel. Um, a lot of the articles go you know, beyond these statements to highlight some of the hotel's other green initiatives, like the fact that these you know, biodegradable cleaning products, they maintain their recycling program, and you know, encourage their employees to use mass transit. So I'll quickly just kind of run through some of the, you know, some, some of the best practices that through our experience. Um, as I mentioned, you know, occupancy sensors. One thing um, highlighted here in this photo is you know, an occupancy sensor that you can, you can add you know, at any time. You don't need to cut open walls to add, to add this. Uh, it communicates uh, wirelessly with devices that are, you know, either your TV is plugged into or your lamps are plugged into so that you don't have to um, spend a lot of money on, on you know, having electricians come in and do any retrofits uh, or any wiring within the walls. Obviously, the, you know, the incom sensors, uh, with the occupancy sensors and the T-stats have been very successful. Um, you know, we're seeing these tied into the reservation systems now so that, you know, they, the room is, is already uh, being activated as the guest is coming up the elevator, um, so that's you know being set to their their own preferences. And then you know something I think Dan had mentioned earlier as well was um, you know doing these infrared inspections, facade inspections. We continue to push our clients uh, for those. We know that the ROI analysis is, a, is much longer for things like windows and, and insulation um, on on the facades, but it's it's something that we, we do get involved with um, you know prior to or after renovation. And then, um, lastly, uh, you know, I, I, one thing I did mention is is on-site renewables. Um, you know, we tend to really focus more on improving that peak efficiency. Um, we certainly hope that we'll get to a point where the building is is as efficient as it can get to, and then and then start introducing those on-site renewables. Um, I don't really, you know, at this point, we we can't really recommend them to our owner because we see that the, their dollars can be spent uh, much more appropriately, much more effectively by improving the efficiency of the existing building before we really start to, you know, get to some of those, um, those you know, the, the sexier on-site renewable stuff, solar panels or wind turbines and that, uh, things of that nature. Hopefully, at some point down the road, though, I will be able to include a case study that highlights a, a zero net energy hotel that we've worked on. Um, I definitely, you know, do see that coming down the, down the road. Um, and, you know, we're, we're certainly excited about, about those opportunities and, and hope that we'll be able to uh, get there at some point, you know, within the next decade. Thanks, everybody, for, for your time. Happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Craig. Uh, Dan, what do you think? Do we have time for questions? Well, let me, let me ask a question to uh, the other panelists um, that has to do with prioritization and, and, and where to get started. So, um, Craig, maybe you could answer that. Um, if a facility wants to get going, uh, what kind of advice do you have to give about how to get things started and how to prioritize these, these, these suggestions? Sorry, can you repeat that? Yes, uh, I'm just wondering if you can give any advice about how to prioritize or where to begin when embarking on, on, on a renovation. So, I think it's, um, I mean, for us it's a, it's a multifaceted you know, multi-tiered process because we're when we're renovating a guest room or renovating a lobby, um, we're looking at it from all sorts of you know from all different angles. We're looking at the water efficiency, the lighting. We're looking at the, the actual physical materials that are going to be used. Obviously, you know, the energy, the the electricity side tends to be the first place everybody goes because that's where the most actionable, uh, most attainable results are. Um, water, we have to get a little bit more creative when we're doing our you know the analyses on on water efficiency upgrades and trying to, you know, justify the ROI and the payback period for that. Um, you know, if you just do the toilets as a standalone, you know, the payback might be eight years. If you do the faucets as a standalone, the payback might be two months. If you combine them, you know, you can make it a little bit more palatable. Um, perhaps, you know, there might be some incentives out there um, as well all that will, you know, make it more attractive to, to do those all at once. Um, but I would say, you know, it, it's really that 
um, internal audit, that self-assessment, and, and as I'm saying, you know, a, a lot of our clients actually, you know, have companies, consultants that, that will go through and and they'll do that assessment, um, do that audit, and they'll identify, you know, okay, here's here's that low-hanging fruit. You know, if you change all your lighting, you're going to get a quick payback on that. Um, whereas if you change the chiller on your roof, it's a much more expensive project. Uh, it's a more intensive project, and you know, the payback's going to be longer. So then, you know, I think through that process, the, the priorities kind of start to reveal themselves because it becomes a question of, you know, what's, what can you do this year? And then hopefully the savings that you're realizing from the things you did this year can then be applied towards, you know, the, the, the less palatable um, projects uh, that, you know, that were identified or prioritized. Great. Thanks, Craig. Well, we're finishing up, but Holly, I wanted to give you a chance to, to offer uh, some advice. If you had uh, one big thing to say to people, what would that be? So um, on the kind of efficiency side, I would say that the things that don't cost you anything as an investment but can start to have impact are those behavior changes. So, you know, turn off faucets, close doors, um, you know, put equipment where it belongs. Those types of things are really quick fixes um, and can already start to result in savings. And on the, the food side of things, um, you know, look for the opportunities where the, sustainable, the more sustainable option is, you know, cost neutral or in some cases even, you know, um, you know, less cost because that does happen, that does occur. And talk to your uh, distribution partners because sometimes just having a conversation will help you identify uh, those types of opportunities to improve your product sourcing. And look at lean fat, reduce that food waste, because that has a that can have a, a very impressive return on investment, and uh, keep organics out of the landfill where they're creating very bad GHG and methane, and you don't want that. So, on the waste side, definitely look at look at that technology, look at those resources on the slide. Great. Well, Holly, I want to thank you so much. Um, today on our webinar, we spoke with Holly Fowler. With, um, with Craig Nicholson and also with Dan Rubin. And we'll be sending out the, the uh, presentation slides after this presentation. And we want everyone to come in next uh, on, on, on April 16th when uh, we'll have our third webinar in the series. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, Rob. Thank you.